will be in verses 30 through 50. And we won't be covering... As, as far as dividing and teaching this section, we won't be covering all of it. And you saw that we did cover some of it last week. Um, we will take the next two or three or four weeks to get through this, but um, our text that we'll read will be verses 30 through 50. <clears throat> Verse 30 says, They went on from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. But they did not understand this saying and were afraid to ask him. And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve, and he said to them, If anyone would be first, he, would be la he must be last of all and servant of all. He took a child and put him in the midst of them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. Verse 38. John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Verse 42 Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin... Tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. As you will see with me over the next few weeks, this text is difficult to categorize and to put together. It's hard to say that there's one theme that unites all of this very clearly and precisely. Some sections of Mark's gospel are nicely packaged and other sections aren't. And honestly, the whole section that we've been in, Mark, for the last couple of chapters, until Jesus enters Jerusalem, it's kind of like Numbers. It's a travel journal where they're moving around and he's teaching them. And so, when I say Numbers, the book of Numbers. And so we will see that this is a challenging text for us to discuss. But I'm going to suggest to you that there are really two points made by this text. And, and the sermons that I'll be preaching from verses 30 to 50 will be called the Dissonant Disciples. The Dissonant Disciples. And today is part one. And there's really two points uh, that are made, and they're about disharmony with Jesus and disharmony with one another. We will see that the disciples are not in harmony with Jesus. They're just not on the same page. Jesus is trying to tell them about his impending death and resurrection, and they're not interested What's the result of that? Well, they're, they're at a disharmony with Jesus, but they're also at a disharmony with one another. We see that because they ignore Jesus' prediction, what do they do? They get into a fight with each other about who's the greatest. And then there's some related and unrelated topics that are discussed, but then the text wraps up in verse 50 when he says, have peace, uh, be at peace with one another. And so our topic over the next few weeks will be what it looks like when we're not in harmony with Jesus and what it looks like when we're not in harmony with one another. And so I'm going to suggest this thesis to you, and we'll develop it as we move through. And it's this. If we are not in harmony with Jesus, we will not be at harmony with one another. If we are not following Jesus in unison, we will ultimately see discord in our church. We just will. And so that is the point that we'll see uh, this morning. But allow me to kind of introduce this. When we think about this topic of walking in unity and, and being at discord with one another, we see that that's not just true of the church, is it? That's true of life in general. You can pick your illustration that people use. People talk about reading from the same sheet of music. People talk about uh, being tuned to the same fork. But one of the truisms of life is that if anybody is going to accomplish anything, in groups anyway, 
We need to identify common goals and work toward those common goals together. If we can't identify common goals, we're not going to get anywhere. In the case of Christianity, our common goal should be to follow Jesus and to glorify God. And so if our church is to live in harmony, we should have Jesus as our common goal, shouldn't we? We should be seeking to follow him and to glorify God. Because of the fall and because of sin, the sad reality of the world is that people are fractious, divisive, and even hostile towards each other. We see this from the smallest scale to the largest scale. We see this in, in family fights, even amongst kids who are fighting over toys. We see this in, in larger family fights as people get divorced and as, as siblings and parents and people no longer talk to each other ever again. We see this on a large scale in our politics when nations can't identify common goals, when nations can't work together, their politics are divisive, aren't they? We see this on a global scale with things like war. The sad state of our world is that we are fractious and divided. We see that from the beginning in Genesis. We saw right after Adam and Eve sinned, isolation and division, didn't we? We saw Adam and Eve who were in perfect harmony with God and with each other, and as soon as they sin, they hide from God and they blame each other. We see isolation. Our only hope for harmony, our only hope in creation is that we be reconciled to God and that we be reconciled to each other. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus, by paying our debt and giving us a new nature, he reconciled us to God and he extinguished the most violent hostility that's ever existed in the history of all creation. Jesus is the hostility extinguisher. One of the results of the gospel is that we're not just reconciled to God, but that Christians are united to each other. It's possible for you and I to walk in harmony. It's not perfect yet, and it won't be until the new creation, until Jesus comes back and restores everything, but the reality is that when we as believers don't live in harmony with each other, we demonstrate one of two things to the world. We demonstrate that, that we don't understand the harmony that Jesus bought for us. Or two, we demonstrate that we do know what Jesus paid for, we do know the harmony that he accomplished for us, and we refuse to live accordingly. Do you have something against a brother or sister? Does a brother or sister have something against you? You need to respond to the gospel. You need to repent. You need to reconcile with that person as soon as possible, even if it costs you time, effort, money, or comfort. Christians need to live in unity with one another. Otherwise, if we don't live in unity, if we don't live in harmony, if there's discord among us, then we demonstrate to the world that Christians really don't know harmony. We really aren't any better off than the rest of the world as far as coming to uh, reconciliation with one another. Jesus did his best. He tried, but it just didn't work. People cannot be reconciled. We'll, we'll talk more about Ephesians and Colossians later, but if you really want to see how the gospel accomplishes harmony, then read the books of Ephesians and Colossians. There was once hostility between us and God. There was once hostility between Jews and Gentiles. And yet Jesus united all things in himself when he shed his blood and was resurrected from the grave. There's another passage, it's in 1 Corinthians I believe it's in chapter six, where, where Paul is addressing the Corinthian church and they're fighting with each other and they're even taking their fights to civil secular courts. And Paul says, are you kidding me? Christians know reconciliation and harmony and unity better than secular courts. And when we can't walk in harmony with each other and when we have to have secular people settle our civil cases, we are really shaming the gospel. We're really not representing the gospel. And Paul even says, it's better for us to just take the loss than to sue that person. It's better for us to just be defrauded than to take our cases to civil court. The, the reality is that the gospel spells harmony. And that if we're not at peace with Jesus, we won't be at peace with one another. To flip that on its head, if you are not at peace with other Christians, if you are holding on to a grudge, then you might have to ask yourself, are you at peace with Jesus? Or do you understand the peace that Jesus has accomplished for his church? Where do we see that? 
We see that this morning as Jesus tells the disciples, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. He tells them, this is the plan. This is what's going to happen. This is where we are going. And the disciples are just not interested. They don't understand the saying, and they're afraid to ask. So they're not in harmony with Jesus. What's the immediate result? They're fighting with each other about who's the greatest. We're going to develop their, the, the content of their fight next week. But this morning, I simply want to look at verses 30 through 32 and, and with implications in 33 and 34 about if we are not in harmony with Jesus, we will not be in harmony with one another. And if we are not in harmony with one another, then we need to ask ourselves how well we understand the gospel. Look with me at verse 30, verses 30 through 32 as we see the disciples in disharmony or discord with Jesus. Look at verse 30. It says, They went on from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples and saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise again. But they did not understand the saying, and they were afraid to ask him. And so as we've seen throughout the Gospel of Mark so far, Jesus is keeping his identity and his mission a secret. He's revealing it just to a very small circle of disciples, probably the twelve, but maybe there were a few more disciples who understood. And as we see him telling them these secrets, he's saying, I am the Christ. I am the King of Israel. I have to come to vindicate Israel as God's people. I have come to restore all of creation. But he's accomplishing it not by conquering with the sword like Caesar or Alexander the Great. He does it by being conquered with the sword, by shedding his own blood and not the blood of others. And so this is the message that Jesus is giving to the disciples. I want you to notice in verse 31 that it says, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. Now, there's a variant there about how we translate that. The Greek actually says in the present tense, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men. And if you're reading a King James Bible, then you have that translation that says he is delivered into the hands of men. Uh, the New American Standard says it's, he's to be delivered. The ESV says he's going to be delivered. But the King James, I think, better represents the Greek. And, and it says that he is delivered into the hands of men. Do you want to know what that communicates to us about the gospel at this point? That it is a surety. There's no question about what's going to happen. Jesus told them previously, it, it must happen. It has to happen. But here Jesus said, the dominoes are already falling. It's already set in motion. I am delivered into the hands of men. Consider this. Judas hasn't even thought about betraying him yet, probably. Probably. Even though Judas hasn't gone to the people to give them an opportunity, Jesus says that he's already delivered. Why is that? Because the gospel is a surety. Allow me to remind you that the gospel was not plan B. The gospel wasn't a tragic accident of history. The gospel was God's deliberate exhibition of, and of love for us and of his glory. It was no accident. It was so deliberate that Jesus could say months beforehand, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men. It's already sure. In fact, Revelation tells us it was sure before the foundations of the world. It wasn't an accident. There's not just surety to this prediction, there's also an irony to this prediction. I want you to notice that it says that the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men. You remember from a couple of weeks ago, we talked about this Son of Man language and how it comes from Daniel chapter seven, and how Daniel predicted that this Messiah would come and he would be like a son of man. Daniel seven fourteen says that to this son of man was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people should serve him and that he would have an everlasting dominion and everyone would worship him. And so we go back to Daniel seven and we hear about the son of man and we hear about things being given over. But in Daniel chapter seven, the son of man wasn't being given, given over. Everything was being given to him. And so, for Mark's audience, who's familiar with Daniel, they're hearing an irony here. Well, hold on. We know about the Son of Man, and we know about things being given over, but it's not the Son of Man who is given over. It's everything that's given to him. And so there's this irony of the gospel that the one who is to receive all things gives himself over to the hostility of wicked men. And so as Jesus predicts what's going to happen to him, there's a surety to it and there's also an irony to it. But how do the disciples respond? 
Look with me at verse 32. Verse 32 says, They did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him. How did they respond? Not well. They didn't understand and they were afraid to ask. Now on the one hand, we can empathize with the disciples, can't we? On the one hand, this idea that he's trying to teach them, it just doesn't fit their worldview. It doesn't fit their culture, their framework. It, call it whatever you want. It just, he's trying to pound a square peg into a round hole in one sense, isn't he? In fact, N.T. Wright, he illustrated it this way. He said, you might as well expect a footballer. Now, N.T. Wright is from the UK, so when he says a footballer, he's not talking about the BSU game last night. He's talking about soccer players. And he says, you might as well expect a footballer planning the best, the biggest game of the season to explain to his friends that he was, that he was going to play with his legs tied together. It just doesn't make sense. You're telling me you're going to win the game by losing the game. How does that work? And so on the one hand, we can empathize with the disciples as they don't understand. On the other hand, Mark does hold them accountable. The text does hold them accountable and say they are guilty because even though they didn't understand, they were afraid to ask. One commentator suggested maybe they didn't want to ask because they were scared of what Peter got last time for questioning Jesus. He got called Satan the last time he tried to get in the way of Jesus' plan to be killed. But to be fair, Peter wasn't asking Jesus back then. Peter was rebuking Jesus, is what the text says. And so the disciples, they tried to rebuke Jesus last time. This time, they, they don't ask. But the reality is, they kept him at arm's distance. They understood enough to know they didn't want to understand anymore. The funny thing is, we have theological questions like that. There are times when there are things that are becoming clear to us in Scripture, and and we understand enough to know that if we look into into it anymore, we're not going to be comfortable with, with where the Bible takes us. But we have to go where the text leads. I had a professor in Bible college say, I go where the text leads, no matter what it costs me. If it costs me my church, my family, whatever it is, I have to go where the text leads. Now, does he practice that? Well, I don't think any of us practice that perfectly, but that's the attitude that we need to have. If, if there's a truth in the Bible that seems uncomfortable to us, it's better for us to go with the uncomfortable truth than to live in our own deceptive world. We have to go where Jesus takes us and where his truth would take us. And you have to ask yourself if you have any of those doubts or questions that you're keeping at arm's length. You have to examine yourself. So we see the disciples at disharmony with Jesus, and immediately after that, in verses 33 and 34, we see them at disharmony with one another. Look again with me at verses uh, 33 and 34. It says, They came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. So here is Jesus trying to warn them of his impending doom, and shortly after this awkward silence that they probably had, here they are arguing about their own status. Why are they at discord with one another? Because they're not on the same page with Jesus. Do you want to know what would have united them and helped them to put themselves aside for a second? Is if they would have paid attention to the fact that their teacher, their best friend, was getting ready to die. Are you serious, guys? Jesus is telling you about what's going to happen to him and you're thinking about who is the greatest. You can remember last time, what did Jesus tell Peter? You are setting your mind on the things of men and not on the things of God. Here, they're doing the exact same thing. He just doesn't say it this time. They're setting, their things on the, uh, they're setting their minds on the things of men. They're worried about their own reputation in light of the fact that their teacher is about to be crucified. I was reading one of my commentaries, and I found a, a handwritten note from Mike Howard in it because it was a commentary that, that Mike Howard gave to me, and I was going to, he's not here, is he? I was going to quote him and ask him if he remembered writing this, but he said that the disciples are like greedy relatives at a funeral. This person's about to die, and the greedy relatives are like pirates seeking to get their hands on whatever they can of the dead person's estate. That's exactly what the disciples are doing. You can imagine Peter and James and John saying, no, you guys don't understand. We just saw something on the mountain, and it was so great that Jesus told us we can't even tell you. You can imagine Matthew saying, yeah, well, I was a tax collector, and I left more than any of you because I was rich and crooked, so of course I'm the best. Peter says, well, he called me first. And Andrew says, yeah, but I introduced him to you. 
James and John, a lot of people think that they were Jesus' cousins. Yeah, well, we're his family. Everybody has their reason for why they think that they might be the best, but at the end of the day, they're not in harmony with Jesus, and that is what caused, that's what's causing them to fight with one another. And this obvious disharmony that they have, it's going to last for the rest of the gospel. Last time, Peter said, this is never going to happen. This time, they're not asking about it. And next time, Jesus predicts his death to them. You know what's going to happen? James and John are going to come and say, hey, when we're in your kingdom, do you mind if we take the seats of glory with you? Can we sit on your right hand and on your left? They're not thinking about Jesus. They're not on the same page with him. And so the rest of this passage is going to describe these different kinds of disharmony. They're fighting with one another about who's the greatest. They're causing each other to stumble. They're fighting somebody who's casting out Jesus in demon's name. He tells them, be at peace with one another. And so that's what the rest of this passage will be about. But I just want to camp on this point, that if we are not in harmony with Jesus, if we are not following him, if we're not reading from the same sheet of music, we will see discord in our church. We will. And when we see discord in our church, we have to flip that around and ask, do we understand the gospel? Are we living in light of the peace and the harmony that Jesus has accomplished for us? And so ask yourself that. Do you have something against your brother or your sister? Or do you know of someone in the church who has something against you? And ask yourself, if you're living in step with the gospel and seeking reconciliation as quickly as possible, There are a couple of options when we live uh, in discord with one another. The first option is that if you're not seeking to be reconciled to your brother or sister, perhaps it's because you don't understand the gospel and you're not a Christian at all. That is an option. That's not the only option. But if you're not seeking to be reconciled to your brother or sister, perhaps you don't understand the extent of the gospel. You don't understand the practical implications that are, that are available to us in our everyday lives. Perhaps you do understand the extent of the gospel, but you are refusing to live in light of it. You are rebelling, and as a Christian, you're saying, I know what Jesus intends for me. I know what's available to me through the gospel and through his Holy Spirit, and I would just rather not. Allow me to give you a disclaimer and just say this that in the last year that I've been here, I really haven't seen much contention or discord in this church. So maybe you guys are just really good at hiding it. Just kidding. But let me extend this to the bigger picture of the universal church. This applies to past churches that you've left and are still angry against. This applies to your family members your friends and your coworkers who might not go to church here, but who pro- profess the name of Jesus. This applies to your marriage and to your kids. If a person claims the name of Jesus, then we should be living in harmony with them. That stings, doesn't it? The men know that I shared with him on Monday night, and Neil knows of a couple other situations that I've shared with him, and I'm, I'm wondering if I'm living in unity with other people in the church that have been from past churches or that are from other churches that I know. And so I don't say that, oh, this is just you. As I'm reading these texts and as I'm dividing these, I'm going, I don't know if I'm living in step with the gospel the way that this text says that I should. But let's just spend the rest of today talking about what the gospel accomplishes for us and how we should live in light of it and reminding ourselves that if we're in harmony with Jesus, that the result of that is that we walk in harmony with other believers. Let's take one of those options and say that you are a Christian, that you're at odds with another Christian, and that you need to hasten to resolve it as quickly as possible. You need to hasten to resolve it as quickly as possible, and many times it's uncomfortable for us. Many times it costs us time and money and comfort. But sometimes we need to go to another person and have a transaction of reconciliation with them. Not a financial transaction, but perhaps you need to go to somebody and say, you have offended me, or I have offended you, and I know that there is something between us, and I'm asking that we be reconciled. I'm not guaranteeing you that you will find reconciliation, but it's on us to try. So perhaps you need to go to somebody and say, either you've offended me, and I, and I need to forgive you, or I've offended you, and I'm asking for your forgiveness. Will you forgive me?
That might be you. That might be what you need to do. Perhaps you don't need to go to that person and have a transaction with them. Perhaps you just need to forgive them in your heart. Perhaps it's not something that they know about or that they need to know about. Perhaps you just need to pray and ask God to give you the grace to forgive that person. Maybe that's you. You need to recognize that just like our disciples in our text who are fighting about who's the greatest, that if we're not in harmony with each other, it probably has something to do with our understanding of the gospel. You can think with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2 describes how we were hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, but that God forgave us by his grace. Ephesians 2 says things like, you were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and yet he has brought you near. Ephesians 2, Ephesians 2 says things like, he is our peace, or that he has broken down the dividing wall of hostility. That's not just speaking of the dividing wall between us and God. That's speaking of the dividing wall between Jews and Gentiles. And that applies to Gentiles and Gentiles. That applies to you and me in our everyday lives. If there is a dividing line of hostility, Jesus has broken it down and he is our peace. We need to live in that light. Ephesians chapter 1 tells us that God's plan for the fullness of time, in verse 10, was to unite all things in Jesus, things in heaven and things on earth. In other words, God's entire master plan for the gospel was to unite heaven and earth in his son and to unite people to each other in his son. And so when we don't live in light of that, we are saying, yeah, God, I know what you've got for the entire universe, not super interested in it. I'd rather continue to live in discord with my brother or my sister. Ephesians 4.26 talks about us not letting the sun go down on our anger because we don't want to give Satan a foothold. Think about the effort that Jesus went through to make recon reconciliation between us and God. He became a man. He lived here perfectly for 33 years. He gave his own life. He was resurrected. He did things that no one else could do. He went through effort and spent everything that he had to reconcile us to God. And here, we won't reconcile ourselves to one another. Reconcil reconciliation is costly. It costs effort and time and comfort and sometimes money. And when we live consistently with the gospel, we should be willing to spend and exert all of that effort and all of that comfort and that time to reconcile with one another. Jesus extinguished our greatest hostility at the cross, and that was between us and God, and our lesser hostilities he extinguishes too. They should all be gone. And so if you're refusing to forgive, you're demanding a payment for something that God says has already been paid. Jesus says it is finished, and you say, nope, I need a little bit more. You're saying that your payment is higher than God's. You're saying that your standard of justice is, is greater than God's because you won't forgive something that God has forgiven. If you're in Christ, you need to live in the freedom and in the harmony that Jesus accomplished with his blood. We need to be at peace with one another as the text ends. Now perhaps you're not a Christian. Perhaps the reason that you're not in harmony with other people or specifically other believers isn't because you understand the gospel and you're refusing to live in light of it, perhaps you don't understand the gospel at all. Perhaps you don't understand the effort that Jesus went through to forgive us. Allow me to invite you and, and remind you and warn you that if you are not in Christ, that hostility has not been extinguished. You still bear hostility against God, and, and I hate to break this to you, but God still has hostility against you. If you are not in Christ, there is a flame of fire burning in anger against you. And that's not the end of the story either. Jesus died to extinguish that flame and you just must repent and come to him in faith and he will forgive you for free. But we need to remember both of those truths that we will stand in judgment before God for our hostility. If we live in rebellion against him, if we shake our fists at him in light of his creating us and sustaining us and giving us a life and, and, and grace and sending his son to reveal him to us, Psalm 2 says that his anger is quickly kindled. 
but blessed are those who take refuge in him. He is angry, but he also offers refuge. John chapter 3 says that the one who believes in the Son has life. The one who does not obey the Son does not have life, but God's wrath abides on him. If you're not in Christ, God's wrath abides on you now, and it is waiting to snap. Just waiting. He offers you forgiveness and peace. God offers to forgive you at the price that his son Jesus paid. Jesus shed his blood to extinguish that hostility because that hostility was an anger against our sins. Our sins merited a payment of death in hell and suffering for eternity, and Jesus came to extinguish it. Jesus came to pay it and to satisfy it. And so I beg you, please repent. Appreciate the high price that Jesus paid to forgive you and to reconcile you to his Father. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 26. It says, if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has spurned the Son of God and profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of of grace. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Consider this. You have been given knowledge of the truth. You have been told the gospel. And Hebrews says that if we hear the gospel and we reject it, and we go on living in deliberate rebellion, high-handed, arrogant sin, that there is no longer a sacrifice for us. God offers his forgiveness to us if we will repent. And he says, even this law of Moses, there were crimes that people committed under the law of Moses. And if there were two or three, three, three people who there who could confirm that a person was guilty, that they deserved death. And he says, how much more guilty are we if we reject the gospel in light of the Son of God and the Spirit of God, the two or three witnesses. How much more of a punishment do we deserve? Do you, do you notice the irony there? It says that we outrage the Spirit of grace. In verse 29, He is a Spirit who gives grace, and yet we outrage Him when we reject to live in the light of His gospel, when we, re, when we refuse to repent and humble ourselves and come to Him in faith. Verse 31 says, It is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God. And so if you don't know Jesus... Don't just be scared of the flames and threatened by the fear and the anger that burns against you. Also know that God has grace and forgiveness and patience waiting for you. And, and if, you don't know, if you don't know this or how this works, then please talk to somebody afterwards who knows. Many of us who here know Jesus have been forgiven of our sins. We know that forgiveness. We know that grace. And we can tell you that there is nothing like God's grace. There's nothing like the patience that he shows to us, and there is nothing like being forgiven and being reconciled to our Father and our Creator. So if you don't know Jesus, then we beg you and we invite you to come to know him and to repent of your sins. Allow me to end speaking to believers. As we consider what it's like for the disciples to ignore Jesus' prediction and then to fight with each other, and we consider how incriminating that is and how really silly it was for them to ignore Jesus talking about his own death and then to go on and fight about their reputation. Consider how much more accountable we are. They didn't understand the meaning of Jesus' death. They didn't even understand that it was literally going to happen, and yet they're fighting about their priorities and their reputation. How much more silly are we How much more incriminated are you and I when we who know the sacrificial death and resurrection of Jesus, 
We know what has been accomplished for us. We know what Jesus gave for us. And yet we continue to fight about who's the greatest. We continue to hold grudges against each other. Especially as we continue, or as, as we partake of communion in this morning, know this, that when we take communion, we are affirming agreement with one another. We are affirming that we are all in Christ, that we have all been forgiven, and that we can all know the testimony of His grace. If you have something against your brother, then we encourage you not to take communion. And it's not, you won't go to hell for not taking communion. You're not guilty. You're not, we're not going to judge you or condemn you or never let you come back to church. But if you have something against a brother or sister, then we just encourage you not to take communion because this is a time of agreement and of celebration. Before we take communion, let's pray.